and turn on our microphone. So all of you um, online, let me actually switch so you can see who is talking. That's going to be me. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to uh, Professor Ochoa's uh, author reading. So um, if you saw on the screen, your microphone and video will be off by default if you are joining us online. Um, those of you who are in the room, I'm going to let you know that uh, we are recording this session. So um, any of your questions, um, uh, your voices will be on the, uh, the recording. However, the way that we have the camera set up, your faces aren't necessarily going to show unless unless you want you want us to show your face <laughs> I'll take volunteers in that case but let me move go back to Professor Ochoa's view here there we go and I'm going to get rid of this thing that says your microphone and video will be off by a oh no we're not doing break time shoot ah there it is there's the thing. So we'll go to our nice. Can we pull up the page here? Yeah, we can pull up a page. Yes. Go for it. Let's do this. Okay. This is on the Canva. Huh? This is on Canva. Oh, okay. But it's not the library thing. No, no. If you want it, we want we can pull up okay, a library page. That. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm there. I'm gonna do like that, right? Yeah, that'll work. Well, that'll fine. work. All right. Whenever you are ready, sir, take it okay. away. Oh, there are people are signed in. Yes, yeah, we've got looks like 23 folks. Oh, so, wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Welcome Thank everyone you. who is Thank joining you. us virtually and welcome everyone who is here. <laughs> Well, yes, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, thank you all for, for joining me and for, for coming. I know, you know, it's Thursday, it's the end of our week, our work week, it's, it's the end of the day, and we finally got a, a, a really pretty day out there after all the cold and the rain and the, and the blahs, right? And, uh, and here we are, locked up, you know, uh, inside for, for a reading. So, yes, I'm, I'm humbled, and I really appreciate that, um, that you guys took the time and, and, um, and came out to so I could share this work with you, right? Um, I know at the end we're, we'll probably have like a question and answer period and stuff like that. If you guys want to uh, ask me questions, I'm going to try to start to 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 answer some questions or at least things that that, that usually come up when um, um, when I'm when I'm doing these these talks or or presenting or. or when I'm just talking to people in, in in general about writing, right? One of the main questions that comes up is, um, you know, uh, why do you write? You understand? Or, or how do you write a book? How do you, you know, well, there's steps, right? To, to you know, first of all, you need, you need you need to write the manuscript, right? And then you need to shop it around. You got to send it out to uh, to publishers, and, and you got to you come up with a query letter. So there 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 is a, a a process, right? Um, why you write? I'm leaning towards insanity as the motive, right? You must be out of your mind if you're going to sit down and do this, right? Because you know you're you're joining the toughest gang out there, right? You, you know it's the one where you're going to you know bury your soul for someone to come by and 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 critique it and, you know, poke fun out of it and stuff. You know, my, um, my first book was a couple of, couple of hundred pages long. And most of the time people would come up to me and say, do you know, on page 18, you misspelled, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah. well, you know, there's editors and there's copywriters that, you know, should have seen that. And, you know, well, what can I tell you? Right. Um, and, and that's the least of it, right. Everything else. you know, I, I remember, um, um, finishing a story or finishing a chapter and it taken me hours, sometimes days to wind down and to be able to sleep again. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's insanity that, that causes us to write, but at the same time, I also think that it's, it's therapy, right. That, that we have to write because we have to get it out. Right. We, we, we have to get the, 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 the stories out and, um, and how we do that, well, that's the tough one, 
right? You can go through programs, you can take classes, right? Like, you know, I did, I, I went through a master's program, and then I went through an MFA program, right? Um, in creative writing, and it taught me jack squat, right? <laughs> All it did was give me a, a good reading list and, 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 uh, um, and things like that and what I found out right well because you know I was that kid uh, you know uh, those of you who've taken English with me I, you know I, I always tell you I was that kid that, that when they were they would say you know we're going to have an essay exam or you know your your grade is going to be based on an essay that you're going to write I was the one jumping up and down going yay, 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 yay because I knew right I knew that if I could write something make a claim and back it up I was going to pass Right. And there was no way in hell anybody was going to beat me at arguing. Right. No, that was that just wasn't going to happen. No teacher was going to, you know, I had I had it all. Right. So um, so I always I always, you know, liked to write. It, 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 it was, you know, my essays would always get read in class and things like that. Thank you, Miss Cox. Right. Maybe rest in peace. She was always real good about uh, um, doing things like that. But the. The reason I think I write, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start by reading of all things, uh, the acknowledgement section, right? This is where you're supposed to, you know, thank you to all my professors for teaching me how to write, and you know, thank you, you know, uh, uh, you know, what is it, you know. Uh, like, you know, you just won the Super Bowl, you know, first I want to thank God and country and, you know, all the people that, you know, all the people that supported me during all this and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's what you're supposed to write. Yeah, but this is what I wrote for my acknowledgement um, page. Right? I would like to give special thanks to my family, my parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, and all the stray, broken and travel weary people who came into our lives for the ability to tell a story. I can remember countless hours of sitting quietly in the kitchen, pretending to eat or in the living room, pretending to watch TV, while the grown-ups talked in hushed tones and whispered gasps of astonishment about things that should not have been known and that should never be repeated. I used to linger about trying to go unnoticed while the elders of our clan laid out our family's darkest secrets until I blurted out, but why? I would then get yelled at and ordered out of the room with mom saying, you're always hearing things you shouldn't and then you can't just be quiet. You have to say something. My father would ask, sometimes with pride, but oftentimes with resentment, why are you always interested in these things that happen to us? Right? They were all great storytellers who were blessed with a special ability to recognize significance. Right? They, they all had a, 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 a tact about them. From my family, I learned why stories are told even when they shouldn't be. For this, I will always be great, right? Because, you know, that's what I realized more than anything, right? When I, when I would read, especially when I would read um, um, stories written by other poor people like me, the stories written by other Hispanics like me, it was always, you know, I'm poor, please love me anyway. I'm brown and poor, please love me anyway, you know, stuff like that. And um, my family was more like, I'm brown, I'm poor, y que pendejo, right? They were the, right, the, the, um, now, how can I describe this? Okay. The The thing is that, okay, you got the cover, right? by Juan Ochoa. By and, and other tales of bad hombres and nasty women, right? Um, by Juan Ochoa. And of course, I'm Juan Ochoa, right? Obvious, no? Well, no, not so much, right? When... Um, um, I was born and raised in California until I was 10, right? And in 76, my family migrated from California to Texas, right? And then a couple of years after that, when my father had quit working, because my dad, for 33 years, he did construction, he worked in the fields, he, um, he drove a truck, he worked in a nice house, he worked in a bakery, almost every job imaginable, my father did it, right? And he did it well. Right. He was a foreman of a dairy. He would, you know, he'd always rise up to be the top worker, the top picker, the top whatever. But it was never enough. Right. He could never make ends meet. Right? 
So by around 1979, my father says, uh, um, Avente la lonchera. I threw away the lunch pail, right? And he dedicated himself full time to drug trafficking. Right. And again, just like when he worked in the bakery and just like when he was picking the fields, he had to be the top picker, the top worker. He rose to the top ranks of, of, of drug dealing. Right. And again, I, you know, I tell everybody, I don't care how much, you know, or how much you, you moved or, you know, people have moved. We did more. Right. We were my dad was moving industrial quantities back in the 70s when, you know, there wasn't too many people doing this, this, uh, um, this type of thing. So we leave California in 76, and by 79, we're going back, right? We're making our triumphant return to California. My mother rents a Winnebago, right? An RV that we can drive, right? We're gonna load up all the kids, right? And she gives me $600 to spend, right? I'm a kid. Right? $600, that's a lot of money. And I said, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? And she says, well, we're going to go to Disneyland. We're going to do this, you know, and you're going to need clothes. Go buy yourself a bunch of clothes. Right? I said, okay. I'm a kid with money, right? So what did I do? I walked into a t-shirt shop and I got a bunch of t-shirts and with decals on it, right? That, you know, you could iron off the decals and stuff like that. And one of the one of the shirts that that, um, that 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 I bought was this little mouse, right? And the little mouse is backed up against a rock, yes. And and he's sweating, right? He doom is coming, right? The eagle is gonna come landing down to snatch him up. It's got its talons out there, the talons, the, the claws are there, right? And the mouse, he has nowhere to run. You know, he's backed up, he's exhausted, he has no more left in him, right? And the eagle's gonna, gonna you know, snatch him up and eat him. And that mouse is sitting there going, <laughs> shooting at the finger, right? Flipping at the bird, right? To the ultimate bird, flipping at the bird. And the shirt said, the last great act of defiance, right? And I saw that shirt and I said, just said, this not only defines me, this defines everything about me, right? This is who we are, right? We were the poor, we were the downtrodden, we were the ones that were destined to fail at birth. Before we were born, that was already written. You know, you are just not going to make it. You just cannot win. But I don't know what it was, what gene, what strand that came out of my family that we all just have to sit there and, okay, <laughs> I'm going to lose. You're going to snatch me out. But you're not going without a fight, right? We're not going. And uh, um, and that's that's what I... I uh, I would try to figure out, right? Why, why are we like this? Why, you know, what, what, what happened, right? And the hard part about this was understanding the, that my fears, my anxiety, my depression, my traumas are very much mine, but they're also very much inherited. Right. Because just like hair color and skin color and, you know, whether you've got, curly hair, straight hair, whatever, like our genes, our traumas are also passed down generation to generation to generation, right? And I always wondered, you know, why, why, well, why, why are we the way we are? Why, why, why are we so different from, um, from everybody else, right? So I had to, ask I, and you know what's going on here why why do you believe this why do you act like that and of course um you know i i, I grew up in a uh, a very traditional mexican household with very traditional loving parents who when their children came to them with with questions and doubts and and fears right uh they responded accordingly by telling us get them see them. <laughs> shut your mouth and go to sleep get, get away from me don't bother me I'm busy right and no you, you weren't going to get these answers right but every now and then uh, my father or my mother or my grandmother 
uh, would say a line, would say a, 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 or make a sound, right? Um, I remember one time I, I was uh, um, driving with my father, right? As soon as I learned how to drive, I would have to drive. I was my father's chauffeur, right? And I'd have to drive him to all his crooked dealings and all his, you know, business meetings. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we'd start off in Houston and we'd end up in Dallas and then we'd come down to Waco and then we'd go to Corpus and then, you know, all in one day, you know, stopping and going and stuff like that. And I remember one time we were driving down the road and we're driving by a, a, a cotton field and there's people, you know, picking cotton, right? And they're going like that. And, uh, and my father is looking out the window and, I, you know, I'm driving and I'm watching him and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, boy, I, I bet this brings back memories, right? And, um, and I want to say something, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's my dad. And, you know, you don't mess with my dad when he's deep in thought or even when he's not thinking or anything like that because, you know, the backhand was always always right, ready for it. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, my dad says, Guantas, bolas, Don Cuco. And I always wondered who this Don Cuco was because he was always getting his ass kicked every time it was a bolas, you know? And it was like, you know, what? I said, what's that, dad? And he says, that's what I told the guy um, working the scales when I met your mother. And then I do some, some, some investigating and stuff like that and nobody seems to know anything. And then all of a sudden somebody told me a story about, oh, I remember the day that your dad got up on top of the truck where they had the scales, where they weighed the cotton and he hit the man with the two by four um, over the head and kept on yelling, guantas, guantas, guantas. Well, what would happen was that the guy on the scales, you would throw your sack up and if the sack said, you know, 55 pounds, the guy would write down 50 and keep the other five pounds for himself, mm -hmm. right? You see what's going on, mm -hmm. right? And that particular day, the old man gets up there, hits him over the head, guapas, <laughs> and, and, that, and I was left with the task of building a story around that, right? So I'm going to read that to you today. And it's called How They Met, okay? If anybody um, has gone through the book or gone through the table of contents and uh, a story, you know, leaps out at you or something like that, um, by all means, I'll take requests. <laughs> I don't, uh, um, um, I'm still trying to get used to, to um, to what to you know what to read right okay so here we go this is how they met right? and again like i said this is this is really hard for me because you know it dredges up memory my mom just turned 84 on last friday and um she suffers from dementia and stuff like that but she was a very remarkable woman. Marianne Chavez was the most beautiful woman ever to work in the fields. It's possible that she could have been the most beautiful woman in the world if some Hollywood producer had discovered her. But even in obscurity, Marianne, or Anita, which was favored over her given name, was desired by every man who laid eyes on her and, em and envied by every woman she met. There wasn't anything singularly remarkable about her, although you could not find an imperfect feature on her either. On top, firm and perky, they could barely fill a man's hand, but more than a few fell face first in the furrowed fields trying to get a peek down her shirt to see but a glimpse of the velvet flesh of her darling breast. She had a slender waist, curved, shapely hips, and firm yet not too ample glutes that filled out her denim work pants that zipped on the side like a shell. Anita was not tall, but far from being a flaw, her size was more proof of how extraordinarily attractive she was. It was as if God made her a compact five and a half feet tall so that people could take in her whole frame in one breathtaking glance 
a sort of gift to mankind, like the rainbow the Lord presented to Noah. It was that, the whole picture, the full image of Anita that made her beautiful, made, made her so beautiful. From head to toe, to toe, she was grace personified. Not one to get you friendly with the other field hand, hands, Anita rarely had conversations with any one person. When she did speak, it was to everyone at once. Her discourse was sharp and pointed and sliced almost painlessly and so effortlessly that the tiny cuts her tongue made were a pleasure to endure and only stunned and ached when she stopped talking. Her father was the first Mexican-American to own a business in Edinburgh. And not just anywhere in Edinburgh. Don Alfredo's Mexican cuisine was located right on the main plaza of the courthouse and the Citrus Movie Theater. Judges and lawyers ate there. Don Alfredo did such a thriving business that Anita never lacked any of the finer things a girl could desire. Ruffled panties, silky socks, shiny shoes, nice dresses, and cute shorts for the summertime. But then, when she was in the middle of her 10th year of grade school, so close to finishing and being able to enter college and then become a doctor, her father ran away with their housekeeper, leaving the family penniless. There was work in the fields picking cotton, so Anita and her mother and her sisters all got jobs. She missed her old life, but she knew she would somehow get it back. What bothered her were the things that she could, that she, that could never be again, like playing in the high school band. She missed playing gumbias on her clarinet when, Miss, when Mrs. Winnie left the room. She could never be part of anything like that now, and that hurt her. The past was gone and the present was miserable, but the future was still there and she knew it was just time and nothing more. And now it just happened to be a bad time. There would be better. Although deep down inside, she feared there would not. Unbeknownst to Anita, but only minutes away, there was a man. At 18, Julio Cortina could tear down the whole world and build it back up again, but didn't out of pity for those who couldn't be as great as him. Last night, he almost broke this rule he made by tearing through the town of Westlaco. It was the dog days of summer, and, and instead of withering in the blazing heat like everyone else, Julio had himself a time. The day started off ordinary enough. The work truck blared its horn at a quarter to five, and, and thanks to an unseasonable heavy dew that morning that made the cotton moist and heavy, Julio had his 400 pounds picked by noon. So he hit the town determined to buy a $1.98 dress shirt south of the tracks in the Lado Americano of West Lincoln. He strolled down the shaded walk as conspicuously as he, as he could, stopping to look in, in each window and taking in the displays from as many angles his body could contort. He was just about to purchase a fine white shirt with light blue pinstripes when Mando Gal Mundo Galvan came up and asked him if he knew anybody who could cross a family from the otro lado. How many people are we talking about here? Five, three men and two ladies. One of the men is real old, Mundo said in a hushed voice trying to escape the, the notice of the, of the gringa sales lady. That's gonna cost you 35 Americanitos, Julio said coyly. $35? I'm not asking you to walk them across the bridge, Mundo protested. Yeah, I know, but the current is swift and I'm gonna need some help with the old guy and the ladies. And that's supposing the other two pendejos can swim, Julio said smoothly, knowing that no one, no one could do the job as well as he could at any price. Mundo agreed, so Julio instructed him to gather, gather the group and meet him at the river's edge by the twisted mesquite on the Mexican side. Julio went and found his older brother, Ines, and told him of the group that was willing to pay to be brought across. How much, Ines said greedily. Two bucks a head. So we both get five bucks each? Well, you've got that all wrong, Ines said matter-of-factly. Before Julio could defend his offering, this continued, I'm getting $6 and you're getting 4 because I have the inner tubes we'll need to get those people across. Julio stood with his mouth agape, which only caused Ines to bellow with laughter. You have to get, get up mighty early to get the better of your big brother, Julio. Don't you ever forget that. Julio shrugged and said, you got me this time. Now let's get them tubes and get to work. 
They put the ladies on the tubes and made their husbands swim alongside during the crossing. Hulu laid the old man belly up across the inner tube and, and guided his cargo gently with the current. Ines, Ines swam ahead and was out of the water before Julio could get the first of the, of the rafts to shore. He had to abandon his charge while he sliced through the water and caught up with the ladies' tubes and got them on the bank. The old man was frantic when Julio came back for him, but otherwise safe. Inez took in the whole scene from the bank, clutching his sides and slapping his knees in over-dramatized over mockery. It was still an easy trip, and Julio got paid well for it. He bought his shirt and had dinner at a place that had napkins made of stiff cloth. Then he hit the cantina from end to end. He did tequila shots with beer chasers at the bar. He snorted cocaine in the bathroom, and he smoked marijuana behind the building with a bunch of, of rough customers where the tips of their cigarettes made a scandalous flow with each deep inhale. He ambled home in the darkest of darkest night and had only closed his eyes for what seemed like an instant when the work truck blared its horn. In his haste not to miss his ride, Julio had to put on his good shoes without any socks. He made it to the back of the truck just as it was pulling away, but was able to grab hold of the railing and hoist himself up. He boarded the truck clumsily and head, and head first, but he managed to steady himself with his body bent at the waist and his face just inches away from Anita's wonderful eyes. He looked into those eyes for only a split second and was asleep as soon as he found a space. But in that brief moment that he had held her gaze, Julio was overwhelmed with a sensation that something joyous had just entered his life. In the minutes it took the truck to lumber to the fields, Julio dreamed of an entire life with Anita. Even before his eyelids had betrayed him and were half closed as he was sinking into sleep, he knew it was not that he had to have her. But, and most importantly, that no one else could have. When the truck came to a dusty halt at the edge of the field, Julio was the first off, but he made time fidgeting with the two-by-four board the workers hitched to their belts where they fastened their sacks. Anita selected her rose to pick before he entered the field, before he entered the field. He had to run off Oscar Lopez, but he got the rose next to Anita and set himself to ripping the cotton from its bulb at a feverish pace that, that he made look easy. He was well ahead of Anita when she looked up from the, from the labor with a gasp. Julio was encroaching on her rose and picking her cotton. She had been startled on the truck when his face almost crashed into hers and would have given him an earful had he not looked so embarrassed and asked for pardon all the way to his seat. But to see him steal from her, from her rose, was more than infuriating. It was disrespectful. Anita hurried her pace and began to inch her way closer to where Julio had been picking her own. And then she saw the first of what would be many small piles of cotton picked and gathered for her to just stuff in her sack. There was still a vast distance between her and Julio, but she was able to grain down quickly without the burden of actually picking the cotton. She finally caught up with Julio, but only because he was waiting for her at the end of the rows. She stomped up to him, and got her face close enough to his to make his grin a little nervous. Why are you stealing my cotton, Anita demanded. I'm not taking it from you. I'm leaving it there for you so you won't have to bother, Julio said as casually as he could muster. Yeah, but how much are you putting into your sack before you make the piles? Huh? It's bad enough that that Eusebio robs us of the scales, but now I have to guard my rose from a thieving mojadito? Anita said, throwing up her hands as she spoke. I'm not a mojadito. <laughs> Julio protested. He fumbled in his back pocket and pulled out a worn wallet. With hands shaking with fury, he forced out a shiny green card, exposed a small pack of crisp dollars. You see, I got papers. So? People with papers steal too. <laughs> Anita said, trying hard not to smile. The fact that he had papers and was not just another undocumented field hand made her feel good, but not good enough to forget what, what had started her com confrontation. Look, you pick your rose and let me pick my rose. Then we can all be robbed of the scales. 
Eusebio doesn't take that much, just a few pounds from each sack so he can get something at the end of the day, too, Julio said, trying to get a hold of the meeting. I don't worry too much about it because I got things going on the side. I do all right for myself. Julio had his chin stuck up so high he momentarily lost sight of his desire standing right in front of him. He took a half step forward and looked at, looked at her hard. I can do enough for both of us. You certainly do for yourself, Anita said, backing away and turning to the fields. You do for yourself, Eusebio does for himself, and everyone takes my cotton. Anita looked at the road that, that laid ahead of her and felt the sting of the sun that, that would be in her face for several acres. A knot grew in her stomach. If I were a man, if I were a man, I wouldn't let Eusebio rob me of the scales. If I were a man, I wouldn't let you know nowhere near my ropes. I don't know why you're so mad, Julio said, catching up to Anita before she could get to work. I just wanted to get your attention so I could tell you something. What? Julio stiffened his back and said with all the sincerity he knew, Me gustas para la madre de mis hijos. <laughs> Julio, Anita shrieked, You want me to have your children? I've heard some lines before, but yours has to be the craziest. Julio's face burned with rage. Who's been talking to you about such things? Eusebio? Anita looked at the stern look on Julio's face and the vein on, on his neck that was pulsating and didn't know whether to laugh or run. She pushed past him and took to her row. Julio fell in behind her, but was soon well ahead and was still picking Anita's rows and leaving behind piles of cotton. The whole time he kept running their talk through his head, looking for signs of interest. He couldn't believe it, but he felt doubt that, that, that he might not have impressed her. Most girls withered with just a coquettish glance. Why was she different? Why didn't she gush over him? Could there be someone else? She kept talking about Eusebio. Was she interested in him? No, she hated him. She thought he was a thief. Now that he thought about it, who said there was a beach of thief? He got a check for working the scales. He was skimming from each side. Only a few pounds. It seemed too petty a thing to even consider before today. He stopped and looked over his shoulder and gave Anita his most dashing smile. But she, but she sucked her teeth and picked cotton as fast as she could. He waited for her at the end of the row, but she trudged past him with her chin leading, leading the way to the truck where the scales were. She lugged her sack of, of cotton up to Eusebio, who, who snatched it up and emptied it into the scale. The brass arm and the scales raced to 56, came to a bobbing, st bobbing stop on 54. Eusebio announced, 50. How many? Anita said incredulously. You heard, Eusebio said without looking up from his, from his ledger. But the words hardly escaped his lips before Julio was on the truck swinging the two by four that the workers hitched to their belts so they could hang their sacks. The board slapped Eusebio stingingly across the face as Julio's let, Julio let out a guttural, Guantas! <laughs> Julio brought the board up again over his head before Eusebio started, 54! <laughs> Julio let the board fall again, but had to change his trajectory to avoid the fallen man's defensive forearm and settle for a thudding whack to the ribs. How many? I saw 60. It was 60, it was 60. <laughs> Eusebio pleaded, fumbling over the ledger and showing Julio the corrected sum. Julio stood towering over the gaping mouths of the other field hands who had gathered to witness the spectacle. Julio snatched the leather from Eusebio, Eusebio and declared to all who were here, I'll be running the scales now since Eusebio fell and hurt himself. Anyone got a problem with that? A murmured group went through the crowd as Eusebio scrambled off the truck. Then someone handed Julio their sack and everyone else fell into line. Anita stood watching with keen interest. Without her realizing it, there was a smile spreading broadly across her lips. This one was different. He had a look. Sure, there was lust in his eyes like every other man, but Julio had something else. Determination. With the right administration, Julio could be something in this world, Anita thought. 
Three weeks later, Anita was pregnant with the first of six children she would have with Uli. So you see, it, it was a uh, um, um, you know a, 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 a very hard task, right, to be able to piece these stories together. And of course, you know, I took artistic license and I, you know, and and added um, things to it, right, and. Again, you know, the characters might not be painted in the most favorable of light, right? But they are creatures of the light, right? They they are out there, right? They are, you know, um, and I don't think that the that these efforts, the the that these happenings should be hidden, right? Because, like I said, um, in 76, we left California, and then by 79, we were going back to make our triumphant return, right? When we had money, my father had position, right? And it was at that time that my that I realized that we were Mexican and that we had to cross a checkpoint, right? In California, I knew I was a Mexican, but I thought, we were the only Mexicans, right? If you know, you know what a Mexican is? Sure, me and my cousin Chino. <laughs> we're the Mexicans, right? Everybody else was, you know, okay, right? But it didn't matter, right? We all blended in. We all, you know, but here we had to, the Mexicans were on this side of the tracks. The white people were on that side of the tracks, right? And then when you left the valley, you had to cross the checkpoint and you had to prove that you were from here, right? So my mother gave us all our birth certificates and our social security numbers and every our social security cards. And she said, that's it. You take care of your own crap now, right? Those are your papers. You know, you take care of them. And that is when I looked at my birth certificate for the first time and I realized that my name was Juan Ochoa. Right? Because I would always been called Johnny, right? When I was, you know, uh, I was Johnny and, I, and it was always, you know, Johnny Appleseed, right? <laughs> or Johnny Yuma, because apparently I never saw the show, but there was a show called Johnny <laughs> Yuma way back when, right? And then, of course, there was the Mexican side of, of, of you know, the, um, um, the more affluent Mexican side of the family that would pronounce my name Yanni. Right, so then I was Yanni Se and Yanni Chingas, right? <laughs> so, you know, all this time, I never knew that my name was Juan Ochoa. I actually had to learn how to spell Juan, right? Who has a U in their name? <laughs> how did that happen, right? And, um, and so then, and so that got me thinking, right? And I'm like, okay, my oldest brother is Jose Maria Chema, and he's out named after my great grandfather, right? And my second brother is Julio, and he's named after my father. Of course, he's the junior, right? And my brother Ralph is named after my uncle Ralph, right? And my sister is the only girl, so she's named after the Virgin, right? Lupita, right? Because you know, again, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, we're Mexican. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we come to Juan. <laughs> There's no other, you know, what happened, right? Where did you get one, right? You get all biblical on me or something, right? So, you know, when I get the birth certificate and I see that my name's Juan, right? And I go to my mom and I said, what's up with this? My name's Juan. And I'm like, Oops. I've always been Johnny. I've always been John. I've always, you know, been never Juan. And she says, why did you name me Juan? And she says, Interesting story. <laughs> she says, when I first got together with your dad and your, your big brother was born, right? Um, we were walking down the street. We we're going to go buy groceries or, or, or something like that. He said, and uh, your father, who's a very, very fast walker, right? He's a very agile man, was walking like 10, 15 feet behind me, right? He's carrying your brother. Yes. And, uh, and he never does that. He said, but I'm walking down the street and I'm looking over my shoulder, you know, why doesn't he catch up? Why didn't he catch up? He said, and I look up and there I see a vieja. And there's a woman <laughs> sitting on her porch. And just by the way she was standing and looking, she said, I knew she was waiting on a man. 
right? And I'm looking at this woman and I'm knowing that she's waiting on a man and I walk past her. And the next thing I know, I hear as I walk past, she's saying, hey, Juan, whose baby is that? Oh. And my mom turns around and says, his name's Julio and that's his baby, <laughs> right? And she said, so I named you Juan because that's the name your dad would use we can go fooling around with other women. <laughs> she said, so I named you Juan. A ver si le da vergüenza. See if you can find some shame. So I'm like, so the, the, the circumstances of my birth, right? My existence, right? To shame my father. And she said, that's the only time you've ever been good for something. <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't include that story in this collection. <laughs> that is for somebody else to tell. Right? That you know, that is that is what happened, right? And again, so you know, you're always wondering about um, the identity, right? I, I, I uh, I'm a firm believer that that all writing um, is is about the levels of narration. Right, everything that affects us, right? Whether we're the oldest child, we're the youngest child, the middle child, whether we're you know Christian, whether we're we're atheist, whether we're we're um, um, rich, poor, straight, uh, gay, you know, it, it it affects us. If there's a war going on when we're growing up, if there's you know uh, a depression, uh, you know, er er everything that affects us. And like I said when I started this talk. The generations of the trauma, you know, going down the 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 handed down, right? There, there's just certain things um, that uh, the 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 trigger us, right? And and you know, I was always you know really um, you know comfortable being Johnny, right? Johnny Bench, Johnny, you know, I I, I like that. But when I was working in Mexico with my father and the feds or the soldiers would um, would pick me up and have me held at gunpoint, right? And I'd have machine guns stand out and they'd ask me for my ID and I would give them my license that said Juan Ochoa Chavez on it, right? And they would look at me and they would say, well, Juanito, looks like you're in trouble now. Right. And every time I'd hear that, I'd just be like, oh crap. <laughs> right here it comes. Right. So um, so like I said, you know, different triggers, different, different um um experiences, different traumas, but they all mold us, right? They all they they they, they all form us in, into what we are, right? And uh, and I really wanted to know um you know why we are. The, the 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 way we are so i um i went back five generations right all the way to my great great grandmother and i started documenting what i felt what i i believe to be the pivotal events that um that caused my family to migrate um from from mexico to to the united states and um, I um, I want to read this next story to you because it's uh, it's short. Are we doing all right on time? Yeah, we're about to pull the tips. Okay, I, I think I could get it done. Real quick. You got time for another one? Huh? One more? All right. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this one um, because. Uh, my daughter said she liked it, and I don't cuss a lot. And we're being recorded, so I don't want to. Do <laughs> the story that comes after it is full of f bombs and you know other kinds of stuff like that. But uh, um, uh, you can read that <laughs> on your own. I'll, I'll read this one. This one doesn't cuss too much. Okay. <laughs> Virginia Pettis was was fifteen when Jose Maria Cortina wrote up to her and asked, "Are you going to marry my son or not?" She was shucking corn and only looked up long enough to say. Chetho said he was going to ask me, but he didn't say when. Then he asked me to meet him behind the corrals. That'll be the day, I told him. Don Chema snorted and spurred his horse. The next day, Aniceto Cortina rode up to the bed of spread, leading a burro laden with 50 kilo sack of beans and another of rice. 
He got off his horse and winched with each creaky step he took in his new patent leather shoes that were a size too small. They were, only, they were the only pair in the store that came close to fitting him, but his father had told him to look respectable and he went courting, so he bought them even though they hurt his feet. Virginia, or Gina, as everyone called her, laughed as he walked up, imagining your suitor going headfirst and killing himself before he even made his way into the parlor. You must have your toes tucked behind your heels, Cheto, she said as he passed through her front door. Gina's mother twisted her mouth and tugged on her daughter's hair while, while pointing an accusing finger. Gina sucked her teeth and directed her guest into the living room where, where they had set up chairs and a table for coffee and pan dulce. Ask Chato what news he brings from his travels, Mika, her mother said through clenched teeth. I don't know, I don't know what news he can have that we haven't heard, that we haven't heard yet, being that we live in the same town, Gina said curtly. We found a sheep herder hanging from a mesquite the other day. I wonder what he must have felt just hanging there, Chepo said, taking his seat. He was probably upset that you bought the last pair of patent leather shoes in the store, Kina said. Her mother swooned and had to be held to her seat. <laughs> Before Chepo left that night, he handed Kina a thin pencil coin and told her that he'd be supporting her now. They were married a year later. Chepo was the youngest of the Cortina boys. Kina sized up her sister-in-laws and knew she'd have the whole clan squaring off to her before all was said and done. She kept the cleanest house, had the most children, and was her mother-in-law's favorite. This fact was confirmed when, Mom, when Mama Candida gave her La Oya just before she died. It was a magnificent clay pot. It was bigger than the ones they sold in the plaza and was cured in such a fashion that nothing, no matter how burnt, which she never did, ever stuck or stained that olla. The clay pot had belonged to Mama Candida from the day Papa, Papa Chema went and asked her for her hand in marriage. He brought it with him and put it in her hands. It had belonged to Papa Chema's mother, Mama Querina, and God only knows where that witch got the clay pot. <laughs> The oil was Gina's now, and since it was her husband who had killed that scoundrel who tried to kill her father-in-law, Gina was the woman everyone had to be had to toe the line for. And the role fit her. She could cook the best meals. She could raise the healthiest children. She knew what to do when someone was sick. She knew what to say when someone tried to get out of line. And she knew that no matter what, she could say any goddamn thing that came to her mind, and everyone had to take it. For 18 months, while her father-in-law was in jail and her husband hiding, in, hiding from the law in Texas, Gina ran everything. Abad Chema had taken the blame for, for the killing of Santana, even though everyone knew it was Gina's husband, Cheto, Cheto, who had shot Santana off his horse. Cheto also put a bullet in Santana's brother's Facundo when the sneaky bastard tried to pick up Santana's gun and shoot Cheto. She drove the cart that took Santana and the wounded Facundo back to their spread. And when their sisters tried to keep their mother from seeing her dead son and blaming her for being mistress to a Pachama, it was Gina who hopped off the cart and confronted the daughters face to face. Es tu madre. Es la madre de tu hermano. Ustedes no son nadie para juzgar. But the girls did judge their mother and they judged a Pachama. Now that their brothers were dead, Facundo lingering for months, then dying from the hole in the kidney. The three sisters gathered and discussed the situation. They sold livestock and pooled their money and then headed for Laredo. It was in Laredo that they found the man. For 10,000 pesos, he agreed to kill Jose Maria Cortina. As soon as Apachama was released from jail, he was exonerated on the grounds of self-defense. He headed to the cantina. He was drinking tequila with beer chasers when the assassin sought him in the cantina and made his way down to where, where Pachama stood pounding shots and cheering the mariachi with whoops and gritos. Mister, I don't know you, but I'm willing to bet you won't sell that bender for all the money in the world, the man said, holding his finger up to order a shot for himself. You got that one right, young man, Chema said gleefully. I have plenty to celebrate. I just spent 18 months in hell, and now I'm free, and soon my boy can come home. Nothing could make me give up these bottles of tequila that, that have embraced my joy and refused to let go. 
I like your style, mister, the man said. I like your manner. It reminds me of me. We even wear the same type of gun. Abachema palmed the grips of his 30, 32 Smith & Wesson and I had the man standing next to him at the bar. You handy with that gun, senor? There's only one way to find out. Let's go outside and find something to shoot up, the killer said as he walked to the door. Abachema followed him and both men impressed the crowd that had spilled out of the cantina with fancy pistol work. Chema shot three bottles off a fence post and turned and said, now you. The stranger pulled his gun and spent six shots knocking off two prickly pears off a cactus. Abba Chema examined the man shooting and determined that he was novice at best. You need a little practice, young man, Chema said. Don't worry, you'll get better with time. I won't get much practice with an empty gun, the killer said with a grin. Chema Cortina emptied his gun and handed the bullets over to, the, over to his assassin. There's only three unspent, but half a load is better than none. The stranger took the cartridges in his palm and looked hard at them. But now your gun is empty. Abachema kicked a clump of dirt and snapped his fingers for someone to bring him another drink, which they did. And he drank straight from the bottle before it offered it to the man saying, I'm from here. My spread is just down the road. I've got plenty of ammunition at home. But your gun is empty now, he said. That doesn't concern me, Abachema said. What kind of man doesn't help a stranger when he can? The killer loaded the three bullets into his own gun and leveled it at Abachema. The kind of man who gets paid to kill assassins. The coward emptied three bullets into Abachema and ran away. Chema fell holding his ribs. He pulled himself up to his knees and the men from the cantina forced him to lie down and they sent for a car. They loaded him up in a new Ford Model A and sped off at 35 kilometers per hour to Monterey to get Don Chema to a doctor. Kina was knee deep in the Pescadilla River washing her oil when she saw the group of women descend the banks. She gathered her skirt and gave her oil a final dunk and rinsing. The splashing water had soaked her dress, but Kina couldn't see the bump of a baby yet, but she knew it was there just the same. She knew her own body and she felt the stirrings of life from the moment of conception that night. Chepo had sneaked back into town. She was almost out of the river with her oil hoisted on her hip when the group of women wailed and blurted out the news that her father-in-law had been shot and feared dead. Her knees buckled and the whole world started to spin. She felt her oil leave her hands and heard it shatter on a clump of rocks. She thought she might have seen the broken pieces floating in the swift current, but she couldn't be sure because at that very moment, everything went black. Gina woke up to a room full of people. Her children, Chetito and Rafita, were crying at the foot of her bed. Someone had lined chairs against her walls, and in each chair sat a woman praying the rosary. Gina looked around the room and was about to ask what the hell was going on when she noticed the smell. She picked up a piece of her nightgown, someone had changed her, and took a deep whiff. Why do I smell like piss, she demanded. Zatia Tencha tried to explain. We told you about your father-in-law and you fainted. I was awake for that part, Kina said, kicking the covers off her and sitting up in a blood-stained bed. Why do I have pee all over me? It was one of the ladies from Refugio, Doña, Doña Carmela, who told her. We bathed you in our pee so you wouldn't go into shock. Who the hell told you bathing someone, that bathing someone in pee was good for not going into shock? Kina yelled at the room. Get me a bucket of water and some clean sheets. Get me something for me to wear. See if you can at least do that right, you bunch of cochinas. Can't you see? I just lost a baby. What are you going to do? The Atencha asked while pulling the clean dress out of the armoire. I'm going to go see what happened to my father-in-law, Kina said. Kino went by the cemetery and made Fidencio ride in her cart with her to Monterrey. It doesn't look right for a woman to travel alone, she said. It was nearly four in the morning when she got to the hospital. She had no trouble finding her father-in-law's room. All she had to do was follow the mariachi music. Her father-in-law was drawing his last breath when Kina came into the room. She waited for the last notes of Que Viva Mi Desgracia to finish and then went and sat at the edge of the bed and took the dying man's hand in hers. Get the pasol, her eyes well with tears. 
Chema looked up and smiled. I trusted a man. She was going to tell him that trusting a man is the stupidest thing a person could do, but it was too late. Jose Maria Cortina was dead. Kino ran her palm over her father-in-law's eyes and made them close. She let her hand linger on his cheek for a moment, then turned to the men in the room and asked, where's his gold watch? The maniachi exited and the remaining men held up their palms and stared off into space. Kina sucked her teeth and ordered the remains of her father-in-law to be loaded up into her cart. She left right after settling the bill at the hospital. The sun was going down again when she rode into her patio. Her boys ran out and started to cry when they saw the lifeless body of their grandfather laying in the cart. Kina stopped them by ordering them to help her lift the body out and into her bed. We'll pray for him tonight and bury him tomorrow, she told the boys. She had just gotten the body into bed and combed his hair when the people from the town arrived. She picked up her rosary and stood at, the, stood at her door to receive the mourners. Main, men came running up to her and one of them exclaimed, they have Don Chema's killer trapped in the schoolhouse. Hurry and prepare the gun for Ch Chetito so he can go kill him. Chetito bolted back into his mother's house to retrieve his grandfather's gun. Chetito's just a boy. Wait till Julio gets home. He'll kill that motherless coward. I've sent word to El Otro Lado. Cheto and the boys will be back soon. It will be too late, the men pleaded. The police are going to arrest the killer. Then Julio will kill him some other day, Dina said as she went back into the house. By the time her husband and the two eldest sons made it, made it home, Kino had all the pistols and rifles loaded and ready. They have him down at the jail, she said as she handed her husband a gun. She took Julio to one side and held him by the shoulders and bent down to look at him in the eye. They have the jail surrounded, waiting for you and your father to try and kill the assassin. Don't try anything tonight. You'll only end up killing the officers. Kina squeezed her son's shoulders hard and said, all you have to do tonight is, take, is get a good look at him. Take a good look and never forget his face. The day will come and then you can avenge your blood. Julio made his way around the jail while his father spoke with the officers. He had his brother Ines lift him till he could, he could reach the bars covering the window. He pulled himself and, put, and peered through the bars. The man was standing with his back to him but he got a good look. He let the image burn in his heart before saying, turn around and look at who is going to kill you. But the man did not turn around, even though it was clear that he had heard Julio's words. Julio held onto the bars for as long as he could and slipped back to the ground and joined his father and brother. Chepo took his sons home and approached his wife, who was sitting next to his dead father. Half the town is siding with me and the other half is siding with Santana's family. Did the police tell you this, Kina asked? Yes, and everyone else that I ran, to, ran into in the road. We're going to have a hell of a fight, Chepo said. Where's Chepito? He's out with his cousin Ruven by the, by the corral. I knew this feud would come to this. The stillness of the night exploded with gunfire. Kina threw her, threw her back against the wall and watched her husband pull his gun before saying, they're not shooting towards us. It came from the corral. Chepo was bent over by the curtain, curtain open with the barrel, was poking the curtain open with the barrel of his gun. He straightened up and opened the door. Chetito and, Re and Ruben came running in, holding up their palms. There were men sneaking up from behind the house, and we opened up on them with Abuelito's gun, Chetito said. We went to where they were, and look, this was all over the ground, Ruben said. The boys stood in the middle of the room, holding up their palms, proud to show everyone the blood on their hands. Right after they buried Apachema, Kina made her husband load up the house and move the whole family to the United States. They were traveling out of the town in the truck Cheto had brought from El Otro Lado when she stiffened her back and sat up in her seat. She had forgotten to pack her olla and was about to scold herself for being so careless when she remembered it had broken that day in the river. It seemed so long, it seemed like so long ago now. Chepa looked over to his wife and asked her what was wrong. Nothing, she said. I thought we were going to have to go back, but then I remembered that there's nothing to go back for. They traveled at a steady space, at a, at a steady pace, 
with the truck pointing north at all times. And thank you so much. You heard all the way through it in the whole hour. And uh um and you're you know you're still here. Right? I really um uh, um appreciate you guys coming out. I I hope you enjoyed the 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 stories and that you guys um uh, uh get a chance to to read this because no matter how much I think that these stories are strange or that these things only happen to me, it never fails to um, to amaze me that after every reading or after somebody's read my book, they come up to me and they say, how do you know so much about my family, right? And it's then when I realized that this is the story of all of us, right? We all have a maquinas and a bachetos in our lives and, and you know, feuds and, um, you know, and whatnot's going on, right? It's just that nobody ever talks about it, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> so again, thank you all. Thank you all very much. And those of you that are out there on Zoom, thank you so much, too. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Awesome stories. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're not going to end until Tuesday. Don't forget to tape your waitress. <laughs> uh, we have them at the bookstore. That This guy's from the bookstore. Uh, they'll, t they'll take them back over there. They got them. Huh? I just support them. <laughs> I got one. Oh, no, I don't. Thank you.